the title of my paper is Clad in Mourning. I begin with a quote from a Moroccan psychoanalyst, um, a friend. The mad person is frightening because he or she sends us back to ourselves. For he, con he conjures in an extreme form a pain that we too experience in our lives. The madman helps me grow, makes me think. He is my teacher. Mohamed Fouad Benskroon, a psychoanalyst in Rabat. And then a quote from an imam with whom I also work in Morocco. I said that a nafs, the soul, the desiring soul, is the yeast, the fertile land that shaitan, uh, Satan cultivates and tills. But he does not cultivate grapes, figs and pomegranates. He cultivates desires, cravings and longings, and with them blastings and bombs. From the moment of their manifestation, they make an impression on the soul, leave a mark, and set it ablaze. And now a quote from a woman in the psychiatric hospital in Rabat. The ambulance, the ambulance brought me and dropped me off without chains. I told them, do I have to go with the mud, malhumak? And I will lead back Ali, I recovered my reason. The pills, I buy them myself. I won't throw the pills away. My sisters insult me, Ntihbila, you're mad, you're an idiot. And I say to them, let me be crazy, at least I'm crazy and in peace. But you, you are the ones who are crazy. Rukia. Since Foucault wrote the history of madness in the mode of an archaeology of silence, much has happened in the field of mental health as well as in the practices, technologies and debates surrounding subjectivity, the body, the psyche, the brain and the imagination to further sanction his portrayal of the becoming unthinkable of an experience. An experience that as such had once summoned questions of truth, politics, ethics, life and death. And yet, in the, in the contemporary world and in the context of global capitalism and its crisis, violence, military occupation, destruction and subjugation, the stage and, vo and voices of folly come to the fore again, well beyond the protocols of global health and psychopharmacology, beyond as well Foucault's own historical framing. Engaged in a dialogue with psychoanalysis, anthropology, as well as with Islamic theology and spiritual political practices, and from the particular angle of today's Morocco, the history of madness that I pursue in the work from which this paper draws a few fragments, ask what, it, what does it mean to think a lacuna, engage with an exteriority, or as Lacan calls it, an extimacy, a real at once intimate and irreducibly other, in the everyday, what are the ethical and political implications of such an engagement, which is also an engagement with human vulnerability and unreason, violence and destruction, and what does it mean to pursue this question in the vocabularies, imagination and practices of a contemporary Islamic tradition in its dissonant encounter with psychoanalysis and psychiatry, and the way these inscribe a particular history of the West. Staging the media and experientially performed in the singularity of lives, the dissonant encounter of psychiatry, and psycho psychiatry, psychoanalysis and Islam takes place in Morocco in mental health institutions, psychiatric hospitals, rural clinics, associations of patients and family, psychoanalytic conferences, as well as through a field of Islamic psychology, Ilm al Nafs al Islami that directly engages Western psychological theories, reinscribing them within, within an Islamic vision. This is paralleled by the growth of a renewed style of Islamic healing um, called the Ayla uh, al-Shara'i, uh, divinely sanctioned healing in the tradition of Islamic law, but also deeply marked by the legacy of Sufism and an understanding of the soul, the heart, and the imagination that is related to Sufi tradition, which sharply distinguish itself from traditional vernacular cures. The impact of the concept and practices that ensue is felt well beyond the space of the clinic, carrying implication in the domain of theology, ethics, and politics.
No discussion of madness today in a context such as the one I described can spare the effort of engaging with such modes of theological and affective reasoning as well as the religious experiencing. Indeed, they summon us anew to the problematic of unreason in relation to the question of truth, ethics, and politics, a conundrum that had been at the kernel of Freudian thought itself. In the contemporary redefinition of the Islamic cures of madness, some of the core preoccupations of a psychoanalytic approach in the Freudian and in Lacanian sense are today being addressed. By opening up this possi but opening up this possibility requires admitting a modern heteronymous subject whose freedom and finitude, responsibility and practice are articulated in relation to God and that simultaneously on a different plan but interrelated plan is ethically active in relation to others in the community. This is a possibility a priori excluded in much psychoanalytic writing about Islam where the subject of psychoanalysis is posed as necessarily secular, a, proposition, a, a presupposition, I argue, that runs contrary to Lacan's own thought. Franz Fanon wrote in a famous aphorism that the goal of colonialism, at once military and conceptual, is not to destroy the autochthonous culture, but to produce a, its never-ending agony in the state of a culture undead. At once, and I quote Fanon, at once, at once present and mummified, he writes, and that culture attests against its members. In a similar tone, but in the terms of a political theological figure of failed mourning, the Moroccan uh, Sheikh Abslam Yassin speaks of what he calls the spiritual slaughter of the youth. Tadbih al Manawi in Arabic, morally crushed by the political violence of the state and the mass pull towards undocumented migration. The term failed mourning is, of course, Freud, via the inscription, via the inscription of Nicholas Abram and Maria Turok. For Turok, failed mourning or melancholia is the haunting of an unknown loss that becomes incorporated and transmitted across generations in the form of a crypt, a corpse within rather than more and becoming productive of new forms and configurations of being. The, ima, the, the Sheikh Yassin in Morocco says, and I quote him, some young people flee into the sea, to the water, at the risk of drowning and never reaching land. Others flee into the fire. They choose to immolate themselves with fire. They prefer to die rather than enjoying the gifts of an unjust regime homelessness, unemployment, and the lack of guidance and idea, the lack of thinking. Fanon pronounces his existential diagnosis um, of the annihilation of being in the form of a psychodynamics of intrusion. Sovereignty and domination are located at the core of psychic space, and they're intimately related to desire and the scene of the phantasm. He describes the raised, colonized subject as constituted by the violent intrusion of the other, the colonizer, in the psychic space of the self, an intrusion that evacuates the self and replaces it with the poisonous object of the other's fantasy, an object with which the self will coincide. It is a story of madness, not of madness as the mental illness of an atomized individual, but on madness as a structure of entanglements and imaginary projections that bind subjects violently in a non-reciprocal position by what Fanon calls an aberration of affect. At the center of Fanon's argument is what he calls the attack of the gaze, the look of the other, the white person, but also the colonial system, the white mythology, and ultimately the white symbolic. Most important for this discussion, the attack of the gaze is also an encounter with a drive to destruction as such, a force of disintegration that is both in the other and is found at the traumatic core of the self, in as much as at the core of the self, as in as much as the core of the self is born in the other and is inhabited by desire. I quote Fanon. My body was returned to me spread out, scattered, disjointed, recolored, clad in mourning in this white winter day. Petrified by the gaze, it becomes a cadaverous object thrown into known being. 
black skin, white mask is written from within that hallucinatory space as an attempt to break the spell. Its concepts are drawn from the psychoanalysis of psychosis. The intrusion, the phantasm, is embodied as a foreign implant, a malignancy that cannot be expelled, washed away, for it coincides with the self at its traumatic, as its traumatic core. Sheikh Yassin's figure of failed mourning asks a related question, a question related to what, Fanon, what I was quoting from Fanon, from within an Islamic tradition of thinking subjectivity, trauma, loss, pain, and pleasure, in which the ability to visualize and vicariously experience death and the related ability to engage in a spiritual struggle that shatters and reforms and continually transforms the intimacy of the soul as well as the arenas of collective life is crucial for the possibility of ethics and a political critique. With a similar inspiration, but rooted in a practice of healing that deal healing the afflicted and the mentally ill in the spiritual and the spiritual counseling of the youth, an imam, the one I was quoting before, who is an important interlocutor in my work, describes the medical phenomenology of soul choking, tadiq nafs in Arabic. Uh, the asphyxiation, the choking of the soul, in the experience of despair, in the encounter with theological evil, with political terror, and in the illness of melancholy leading to suicide. Spiritual mur uh, murder and soul choking speak of the subjugation, subjugation of the soul and the oppression of the collectivity. When life shrinks, death is generalized in a proximity that makes it unthinkable and the divine message can no longer be heard in the heart. The ethical political question becomes that of shedding light on, revealing such a state of things, a disclosure that is a necessary shock towards the reinstantiation of a life of the soul. The Imam, so the vocabulary, for instance, that, uh, that is constantly present in our conversations, um, uh, it's a vocabulary that, uh, of disablement and affliction. Uh, just to cite a few words, anakba, affliction, catastrophe, lias, despair, dirk, oppression, choking, dolm, oppression, injustice, al kaaba melancholy, grief, depression, al-bitala, inactivity, al ubusiya gloom, tashaum, hopelessness, pessimism, and so on. Such are the terms that punctuate our conversations. The Imam spoke insistently in terms of a question, one that gave impetus to his work and shaped every aspect of his life. The question concerned the possibility of ethical existence in the vicinity of trauma and madness and in the shadow of spiritual dispossession. I bring this question up for debate in the specific terms of his own formulation by tracing through his words a reflection on subjugation and destruction that is taking place today in the field of contemporary Islam. But I also argue that there is a possible dialogue that can be engaged within the tradition of psychoanalysis with these questions. In his seminar on ethics, Lacan addressed a problematic that may be read as related, if from a different place, and engaged specifically with a European tradition of thinking destruction and creation in between two world wars. One that culminated in Freud's scandalous formulation of the death drive. At the empty center of Lacan's seminar is the chasm of what he calls the thing, Thus ding, at one source and termination of desire, sight of horrific visions and primordial projections, and of the ultimate alterity of death. Lacan called the thing, quote, an original division of the experience of reality, the first outside and the first object, originally lost and impossible to retrieve, an intimate stranger, his words, hostile on occasions, a neighbor. Um, <coughs> Um, a striking, which is, it says, a striking expression in as much as it is pow powerful, articulates at once proximity and resemblance, separation and identity. He says that the thing is an extimacy, ex intimacy, uh, an exterior intimacy, an externality, an, unbear an unbearability at the core of intimacy, uh, a creator that is also an original inscription. 
the thing which occupies in Lacan's reading the place that in Aristotelian philosophy was assigned to the ethics of the good and to the arbitrary rule of the gods is also, as Lacan tells us, the term that the mystic Meister Eckhart referred to, the, by which he referred to the soul, and points to the fact, uh, to a, a point, as Eckhart says, to the radical question of evil as such. Such a thing, says Lacan, cannot be mastered or dialecticized. It can only be encircled. Teddy couldn't have the choking of the soul, the oppression or choking of the soul is the result for the imam of a pain that paralyzes and sculpts the soul and the heart as if in stone. Images of distraction that shut the door to all possibility of imagining a horizon. He describes how shaitan, the principle of a harm, and at once internal and external to the soul, oppresses and terrorizes the soul. I cite him. Hence, the, it, it is in conversation with me. Hence, the nefs, the soul, sends to the heart negative and hopeless images of the future. And the heart forms an image of life as life burned, life destroyed, and starts imagining that nothing good can happen in the future, only oppression and disaster are foretold. All that there is is pain and torture, dispossession and destitution, only that will be. And so that person lives a burning moment, God protect us from harm. And these images, he continues, that the nafs, the soul, receives in the form of a devilish whisper, colonize and murder the heart, which in truth is not the heart of a Muslim. In other words, they're not the heart of a person who has faith. Uh, for if faith is presence in the heart, the person remembers only those images if they are affirmative images. If the heart is deserted by faith, the person accepts those negative images, welcomes them, and they set it ablaze. And choking, the oppression of the soul instills terror in that person, and he can no longer aspire to something that might be renewal, something affirmative, other than his own dying. This is suicide. So the uh, Imam argues that uh, the imagination itself, which is also the ethical faculty by definition, becomes in this case an agent of distraction in a soul snatching that doubles the dispossession in the world, in the social political world. Uh, in his logic, uh, the imagination um, is itself captured, snatched, by an invasion of media images, television images, images of commercials, besides these kinds of things, images of a desire haunted by the commodity, by the sense of failure or impossibility. And because in the larger sense of the, of the soul's worldly desire, the access to the enjoyment of the global and idealized commodities can only be experienced as a maddening lack in the halluc hallucinatory apparition of a fetish, that is, has alienating effects on the soul. Soul choking is the man's depiction of such acute melancholy, a melancholy described by some of the youth with whom I discussed this question in terms of another figure of despair, of despair al qanat the melancholy boredom, loss of hope, which empties the self and sends it off into nothingness. I quote a young man. We say of a person, qanat, he or she fell into despair. A human being, when he falls into despair, all doors are shut for him. He can no longer see or distinguish anything and abandons himself to drugs. He has reached a limit. His ruh, his soul, spirit, doesn't stay in place. He's no longer there. He sent it off with the drugs. And all that he has on his mind is death. This is a description of the vanishing of desire and the surrender of struggle from the point of view of the Imam. For struggle in Arabic jihad and nafs, this ethical struggle of the soul in this vision of, of life and of the soul attests to the presence and activity of an ethical subject. In a different context, wondering what to do, how to think after the butchery of World War I, 
Freud resorted to the notion of a primary destructive drive and its radical heterogeneity. Instead of ambivalence, it's a eluctability, and on the intimate enemy, which is the death drive, can be read as an engagement with questions that are actually similar to the questions that Imam is asking. In Beyond the Pleasure Principle and Civilization is Discontent, Freud elaborated this as a radical ambivalence of life and death that manifests itself in the form of a struggle, what he called the Battle of Giants. The battle takes place beyond, he says, the economic rule of the pleasure principle, in an intermediate zone between the possibility of regeneration and, and the form of, of return to life, and a fatal, pu fatal push towards inertia and death, in what Freud understood as a return to the inorganic state, beyond the subject and beyond life, a radical exteriority that is exposed in trauma. It is in this sense, I think, that, uh, uh, so anyway, the, I'll, I'll just two more seconds. The death drive is an existential, for Freud, is an existential political and ontological lesion at the heart of life, which takes on the connotation, for Freud as well, of the theological concept of evil. Um, so, let me just conclude. For the Imam, in this, it is in this sense that the Imam actually stresses that there are two ways of inhabiting pain. There is the way of inhabiting pain that actually incorporates it into the soul and develops, uh, sort, of, it, it, it sort of pushes the person towards annihilation. But there is another way of inhabiting pain um, which is it, in which the soul bears witness to pain without succumbing to it. And this other way, which he actually elaborates and discusses in terms of, of, the, of the mystical thought of, of Al-Ghazali, of, um, of, of an Islamic mystic of uh, uh, the late 12th century, um, is something that produces an expansion of the soul. Um, it is an opening onto death as a way of seeing and tasting, he says with Ghazali, in a different modality of melancholy from the closing up of the horizon and the generalization of the death drive in soul choking, inhabiting pain through the bodily imagination, connecting to others in their space is both unbearable and expansive. And yet the two modalities are contiguous, the Imam stresses. They can never be set apart. Ethical being is precisely that intimate structure, struggle, with the heterogeneity that can never be resolved and with the violence that is never lurking. And it is therefore in this sense that I read the Imam's understanding of jihad and nafs, the struggle of the soul, with Lacan's moving beyond the Aristotelian ethics of the good and towards an ethics of the vulnerable struggle, a kind of wrestling with an intimate exteriority and extremacy.